Thank you, Dr. Alka. Come, I'll just make a comment. Because, because we are running, running short, short of time, time I will... will... A very good afternoon to all the doctors here. And after the very eloquent talk by uh, Ami, I would like to straight away go into uh, pharmacotherapy for type two, uh, for pre-diabetes. Uh, my views are very much different from Ami. I agree that there is no way that pre-diabetes can be managed uh, without the help of lifestyle. But I would like to take you through this journey of what happens actually and how we can change things. Change is the only constant. Uh, the figures we are seeing here are all of the DPP and the UK PDS. At that time, there was just your sulfonylurea and metformin. We need to understand that we have moved on. Uh, there is metabolic memory. There is a legacy effect. The earlier we act, the later are the complications of diabetes going to come in. Uh, I, so this is pharmacotherapy. So pre-diabetes is a condition where blood sugar levels are high but not high enough to be labeled as diabetes. So this is only the definition. For me, pre-diabetes is a window, it's an opportunity, it's a time for intervention. This is the time where we need to act. Yes, I totally agree that we need to have a good lifestyle and a good diet counseling, but I'm gonna take you through, uh, let's uh, refer to Mr. X itself. If you remember the figures, you will see that he is mildly hypertensive, he's obese, uh, he has a family history of diabetes, and his HbA1c is uh, 6. As for me, these are all, he's a high-risk individual and definitely a candidate for uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, enough conjecture. Right now, I'm going to take you through hard science, showing you why drug therapy is the way to go. At the same time, I will say that, yes, lifestyle modifications are required. So I'm not going to be talking about the diagnostic criteria. We all know this. As far as Ig... Uh, Pre-diabetes not being an entity, I think it's an entity, it's a number game. Uh, what is the difference between a patient having an HbA1c of 6.3 and 6.5? 6.5 calls you to be a diabetic and 6.3 calls you to be a pre-diabetic. But I believe it's an actionable course. This is our window of opportunity to prevent complications in the long term. My patients are going to be thankful that I am reducing their cardiovascular risk in the future. So this is uh, the study which was done, the Botnia study by Dr. DiFranzo, and these are the numbers that we see that IFG and IGT, both of them have nearly the same amount of conversion uh, rates to diabetes, but when there is a combined presence of both of them, that is when there is a huge amount of increase in the uh, conversion to diabetes. So uh, why should we use pharmacotherapy in the development of uh, type 2 diabetic for conversion of type 2 diabetes? in high-risk individuals? So the answer is very simple. Because non-pharmacological therapy, just the diet and the exercise does not work, but the key words here are the last line, on a long-term basis and in the real world. I'm going to go ahead and prove these points to you. Now, DPP is the one study which all of us have been hearing from the longest time that timely intervention is what has prevented the lifestyle modifications have helped reduce the conversion. There were three arms here, the intensive lifestyle change, the metformin, and the standard lifestyle change. The patients were followed up for three years. And as Ami rightly said, the diet and exercise group did way, way better. There was nearly a 60% reduction in the conversion as against metformin, which worked at only 30%. But I want to go ahead and show this. Has this been spoken about uh, adequately? There were 16 sessions, one-on-one -on -one basis. They had a personal coach. There was 150 minutes of exercises under uh, the guided uh, physical uh, expert. Does this really work in real world? Do we have the time? Do we have? And it was all paid for. So does this work in the real world? Can our patients, whether it's in the metro or in the rural areas, actually afford something like this? So that's why I say intervention of lifestyle, excellent. It has to be done. It's not a choice, but it's not enough. Uh, the same DPP study also had a fourth arm, which was the troglitazone arm. And if you go to see, uh, because of the side effects of the drug, it had to be, uh, uh, the study could not be shown on all the papers. But this graph is there in the DPP. And you'll see the huge difference in the conversion of pre-diabetes diabetes where troglitazone has been used. The thiazolidendrons, I agree, metformin is not a very strong drug for preventing conversion of prediabetes to diabetes, but the glitazones work really, really well. I'm going to go ahead. There are multiple studies, uh, whether it was the Chinese uh, diabetes prevention program, the Indian one, or the American uh, study. 
the tripod, the bipod, and the dream study all showed how well the, the thiazolid endurance work. I'm going to be talking a little more on the ACT NOW study and the STOP and IDDM study. All of them, if you look at the uh, relative risk reduction of conversion from prediabetes to diabetes, the numbers are extremely encouraging. So this is, uh, I don't need to go through this. You can see that more than 50% reduction in the conversion from prediabetes to diabetes when the thiazolid endurons were used. I'd like to take you through the ACT NOW study. It's basically the prevention of type 2 diabetes mellitus. The IGT group, that is the pre-diabetes group, was, uh, had two arms. One was given the placebo, one was given pioglitazole. Amazing study. You can see that uh, when the kaplan meier uh, graphs are read, there is a significant reduction. There is a conversion of pre-diabetes to diabetes only 2.1% as against the placebo group, which received 7.6% conversion, which is still the going standard rate of 7 to 8% conversion per year. So the incretins also we know, uh, we cannot ignore them in our current scenario, that what is the effect of incretins? All of us, I'm sure, uh, if at the time of DPP uh, study, if the incretins were present, we would have a very different take about uh, the study. This is a study which is shown, the, I think this is the uh, scale study, which is converting, uh, which is comparing the effect of liraglutide as compared to placebo on patients who were pre-diabetic. Very, very huge separation between two, uh, the uh, graphs. The hazard ratio is extremely uh, significant and hence proves my point that yes, pharmacotherapy is an important part of management. To summarize, I agree for uh, preventing the conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes, diet and exercise will remain an important part of our treatment profile. But metformin, glitazones, the AGIs, especially in the sub -Asia, South Asian subcontinent, we need to make sure because we have huge carb load in our diets. So the AGIs also work very well for prevention of conversion of prediabetes to diabetes. Uh, GLP-1 analogs, I cannot speak enough about them. Just because the cost is a factor, I don't think we can ignore them. They are here to stay. They are going to be changing the way we treat uh, diabetes, whether it is the injectable form or the oral form. Now, the STOP diabetes study was very interesting when I was going through preparing for this lecture. And uh, there, were, there were three arms here, and they were assigned drug therapy depending on the severity of insulin resistance. And the three arms, one of them, the one with the mildest amount of insulin resistance, uh, worked on lifestyle alone. The moderate amount of insulin resistance received pioglitazone and uh, metformin. And the arm which had the maximum amount of insulin resistance received three drugs. That was uh, exenatide, pioglitazone, and uh, metformin together. And this is what it showed. The conversion rates of prediabetes to diabetes, the people who received the triple uh, cocktail was literally zero. None of the patients converted. So I'd like to rest my case saying that prediabetes, uh, please make the actual uh, Take care at the right time, be uh, drug forward, give your patient the benefit of metabolic legacy. Let's not wait for the side effects to develop or let's not wait with our clinical inertia. We don't want to be in the situation where this doctor uh, had his patient telling him, Doc, the low carb diet you gave me a lot of years ago, the only thing it gave me was diabetes, blood pressure and heart disease. So I end my talk here. Thank you very much.